Today, we're going to hand over the reins to Security Bytes, our sister podcast ran by our very own CISO, Jim Tiller, as he talks to experts across that sector, finding out what the biggest challenges facing that industry are. Zero Trust is about removing trust relationships from within digital systems. Computers don't give a crap whether or not they like each other or whether or not one smells nice or whatever. If there's a reason for this thing to talk to that and it's allowed, it will happen. Welcome to Security Bytes. A show where we're joined by an industry-leading cybersecurity expert to discuss today's pressing business and technical challenges of security. Join me, your host, Jim Tiller, brought to you by and powered by Nash Square. Let's get started. My guest today was the NCOIC, the non-commissioned officer in charge within the NSA and U.S. Navy Cryptologic Service for 14 years directing and driving comprehensive threat intelligence to blend cyber and connect operations on the war on terror. He was also the senior analyst for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and worked closely with all the three letter groups, CIA, FBI, TSA, DIA, and DHS, to name a handful. In late 2011, he moved on from the NSA and assisted a number of companies such as Telecommunications Systems Incorporated, Newstar, and Decisive Analytics Corporation before taking on a cyber R&D role at Accenture. From there, he became the head of threat intelligence for Armour and then a few years took a job as a principal analyst for Forrester. Today, he's the chief strategy officer for Aircom. Of course, somewhere between being a cyber war fighter and helping companies with security challenges and being an advisory board member, for several organizations, he managed to author several books, dozens, in fact, many <laughs> bestsellers, including authoring Sinja, an illustrated story introducing kids to the awesome world of cybersecurity and technology. Of course, you may know him simply as Dr. Zero Trust. I give you Dr. Chase Cunningham. How you doing, Chase? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, it's, I appreciate the intro. I, I, w- I wish I'd authored dozens of books. I've authored a few books. Uh, I'm working on number eight right now, so it's uh, it's it's fun. Um, lucky, I've been lucky to contribute and help write like forwards and reviews and those types of things on other folks. Uh, probably more intelligent, uh, you know, uh, publications. <laughs> I, I once you get past four or five, man, I just it's dozens. I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I was. Uh, when we spoke for the first time, you know, not too long ago, I just got a chance to meet you, which I always find fascinating that we have not crossed paths somehow. I just find that completely t- amazing. But anyway, the uh, I was up on Amazon recently and like, oh, there, there's the name again. There's the name again. And um, I think the for me personally, I, I, I love the stuff that you're doing around uh, Sign Ninja kind of thing and for kids because... I'm a huge believer in that. I wish I knew how to do that better, but it's really cool that you're doing it. I, let me start off with asking is, how did you get in to start writing basically these kids' books that, so, that you put together? Yeah, so a really good friend of mine who's like my sister, uh, her name's Heather Dahl. Uh, she had this uh, nephew that was interested in cybersecurity, and we couldn't find any good content on the internet that wasn't just pretty much like blanket marketing crap. Um, and she and I just took it upon ourselves to write, uh, a, what we thought was an engaging piece of content for kids and cyber. And we had a guy who was an engineer at HP, um, named Shiro that did all the artwork. And we wound up publishing, uh, two comics and one field instruction manual that kids have been using. And it's translated into four languages. Um, and it was cool because every once in a while I'll have a kid send me an email. It's like a singe a birthday party or something, which, you know, for, for me, that's pretty slick. That's too, that's super awesome. And I did see it was like, you know, translated in multiple languages. That's super cool because, uh, I mean, not to be overly, you know, not to try not to blow it out of proportion, but let's just be honest, kids are our future and cyber is a big part of life. And, you know, and I do believe that a lot of people aren't, let's just say fully prepared for it all. Right. And so if we can really kind of embrace children, 
uh, because they're going into a world. I mean, I, I, I don't know how old you are or anything like that, but you know, I, I predate internet, predate kind of PCs kind of thing. I'm old and, uh, you know, and I had the opportunity to kind of grow up with it, you know what I mean? And so, uh, and grow into it. It was already alien. Now kids, you know, like my kids, you know, they grew up with a cell phone in their hand, you know, for all intents and purposes. And, uh, and I can only imagine what the world's going to be like when the, the kids that are reading those kind of grow up. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, I, I just, that was one of the things that really interested me about you. And I thought it was pretty cool. Um, but how did you, let's go back to the beginning of your career, you know, when, what drew you into, did you start with the Navy or were you just picked up directly with the NSA? Uh, no. So, um, I've always said that my, my career has been a combination of blessings from above and a com and good people seeing that I was destined for other things. Cause I, I did not join the Navy in the, the cryptologic services. I joined as a diesel mechanic, funny enough. Hmm. Um, and I was, uh, I was on board the USS Cape St. George, uh, guided missile cruiser number seven one. Um, and I was basically, uh, taking care of a, a few pieces of gear that had been upgraded by, um, uh, contractors and those contractors had put in these computerized systems and none of them worked. They were total pieces of crap. So none of them worked, none of them were configured right. And they were making my life miserable because I was the guy they woke up every day at two or three o'clock in the morning to go try and rejigger these things to make them function. Uh, and anyway, after about a month of this at sea, I got sick of it. And I literally snuck up to the chief engineer's stateroom, which is a big no-no. I stole his laptop, which is another no-no. And then I went down into the engineering space and I, I didn't know a whole lot about computers. I, I helped set up the computer lab at my uh, high school, which was pretty simple. But I knew enough to be, I guess you'd call it, relatively useful. Um, and I knew real quick when I, when I plugged it in, because I'd seen how the contractors had configured it, like I saw where they had done everything and I could look at it real quickly because I knew the system and I was like, none of this is right. So I just went and changed all the settings and then pushed it and flashed it back over and it worked. Everything went green. I was like, oh, thank God. So now I can just uh, Tom Cruise my way back upstairs and put this thing away and no one will know. Well, unbeknownst to me, uh, off to my right was the chief cryptologic officer for the ship. And he's walking around because officers have to do these things, get their warfare quals to get familiar with the whole ship. It's like 2.30 in the morning, so there's no way I thought anybody was going to be looking at it. And sure enough, I look and here's an officer staring at me while I'm breaking the law. And I was like, oh, oh damn, like this is it. And he, <laughs> Oops. he just, he just kind of looked and he shook his head and walked off. And I thought, oh man, this is it. I, I actually even um, called my mom on the satellite phone the next day and said, mom, I'd maybe go into Leavenworth, like just FYI. I didn't do anything really bad, but I just want you to know. And, and anyway, he let me sweat it out for a couple of days just because he had nothing else to do, I guess. Um, and then he came down and uh, the cryptologic warfare officer and he's like, do you really like being an engine man? And I was like, no, sir, I'm planning on leaving the service as soon as my, my stint is up. And he goes, hmm. come with me. And the next thing, next thing was start taking this test. And I did really well on the test and looked at all my scores. And he was like, why are you an engine man? Um, and then, uh, the next thing I know I'm off to code school in Pensacola, Florida. That's awesome. I, so just to, I try not to do this on these shows. I like it to be about you. I gotta tell you a quick story is I went into the Navy to basically special warfare division to go into a different group. Long story short, because of medical reasons, I wasn't able to go, but I took all the tests and I'll never forget the guy going to me saying, wow, you tested great. You should go into like communication security. And I'm like, nope, that's not for me, man. <laughs> you know, and uh, little did I know that I, I would come full circle back around to that. But it always, it's so funny is, um, uh, and, I, and I, I, I have a lot of friends that are, that are in the military that have been in military, special forces, all that kind of stuff. And I, there's always this common theme that sometimes it just takes a little bit of luck and somebody to recognize you. And it's just kind of, send you off on this kind of trajectory in your career and things yeah. of that nature. Did you spend a lot of time? Did you end up, you know, I was, I was going through, you know, your background and things of that nature. Did you find that at, at what point did it really become around threat intelligence? What, what, what did it really for you translate from that the cryptographic service really into working with the point of the tip of the spear, as it were, in dealing with cyber threats and cyber situations? Yeah, so I was a CTR, and in the Navy, CTRs are collectors, right? So we basically collect stuff off of electromagnetic signals. Um, and the problem that we had was we could collect all kinds of cool, crazy stuff. But 
we wound up having a really small group of people called CTNs that were able to do the work to figure out how all that stuff was communicating and protocols and all the other stuff and the, the threat intelligence side of it. So um, again, like I said, just a combination of blind, stupid luck on my own part and running into the right people. Uh, I, I, I saw an opportunity at, when I was stationed um, in San Antonio, Texas, to go off and start learning about all this other things because they were the Air Force was offering joint service education. And I, I said, you know what, I want to take every class that you guys have got. So I started taking everything that they had. And then the next next step of that was the command master chief was like Cunningham, um, you know, we're going to move you from signals, advanced signals stuff over to threat intel. And you're going to start doing CTN work. And I was like, cool, great. You mean I get to cross straight to CTN? And he's like, no, you're going to stay in R. You just get to do all their work too. It's like, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> and that was, that was really the impetus for me getting into the CTN, threat intelligence, hardcore computer side of things. So I was, I was lucky because I was kind of um, dual threaded where I could bring signals in and do the collection, but then I could also do the analysis and put a target package together, which wound up working its way into other opportunities further on in the Navy. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. I was going to say something just then is being on both sides of the R and the N piece of it, but gave you a really interesting scenario to collect process and then build packages around it. I think that might've been kind of a unique scenario or was it, was it unique? Is that, yeah, it, it might've uh, been very early on, right? Yeah, it was really unique. It was before they started these things uh, called fusion cells and the fusion cells mm -hmm. were when they would take different services and different people that had different skills and put them together. And then they would task them up with, uh, uh, tip of the spear type operation. So I was really lucky because I was in one of the first, like uh, probably first ish fusion cells in the DOD down there in San Antonio that started doing a bunch of work for forward operating uh, uh, requirements. Yeah. It's interesting. You know um, you know, there's a lot of books, a lot of movies, shall we say that talk about that. I think um, certainly when you get into these kind of getting the tip of the spear, as it were, I don't think people realize just how important, you know, the cyber aspect of, you know, granted, we think of things like, excuse me, <clears throat> things like fighting terror is more kinetic. Um, but, you know, as we we're clearly in the 21st century and you were there, you know, during the early 2000s, um, you know, there was proper cyber activities happening, not only from an intelligence gathering standpoint, but also to be able to put together that intelligence in a way that could be actionable not to overuse that term, uh, and help our, help our, our guys down there, you know, sitting freeing of seas. Help me understand is, um, when you worked with, uh, so for example, you work with the FBI, was that what in your time as well in the military? So did some of your stuff also turn into investigations? Yeah. So when I was, um, stationed at Fort Meade, Maryland, I was part of a, a, a program for, um, I guess they called it kind of internships within the military, within the DOD. And the good thing was because we were already operating at a very highly classified level, if you wanted to do a six month stint at FBI, you could ask if they had a spot for you. And if they said, yes, you could go basically function as a FBI civilian for six months or whatever else. Uh, and then on top of that, I was I got hurt on my last deployment, so I knew I was going to get medically retired. And uh, they said, well, we can kind of dual, let you double dip and you can work for us on certain days and get uh, some contractor money and then also do the internship side as well. So I got to go out there and I wound up working in the cyber uh, threat division at FBI downtown. Um, if you've ever been to that really old, nasty ed, uh, building, which is disgusting. Yeah. And the floors feel like they're going to fall in on themselves. But uh yeah, I got to go down there and I got handed a caseload and did a bunch of investigations and uh, and that type of thing. I never got to was, run around with my FBI uh, uh, windbreaker on, but, you know. Oh, boo, hiss. Yeah, I tried that's to half, get one. I tried, I tried, but they wouldn't give me one. <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I had a uh, an opportunity to work with the TSA very early on as part of some work I did actually with CETA. And... You know, and I and I found, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that are actually, you know, poking up within that piece of it. And also, I thought I'd get your thoughts on this as well. But, you know, a lot of the sort of facial recognition and stuff that you're seeing on international travel and that's sort of expanding pretty rapidly and the role of TSA. But what was some of the work that you did there? Because I think, um, you know, I think a lot of people think TSA is mostly sort of the physical side of security, obviously airport security. But what, what were you doing some of that space as well? So in, in that in that branch, it was DHS, uh, and uh, a lot of what we were doing for them was basically showing them how vulnerable their systems were 
Um, <laughs> so I was I was working with one of, with one of the groups that did red teaming within those uh, sub agencies, cocoms and those types, and we were basically ripping their network to pieces and then coming back and going like, hey, if we were a bad guy, this is what would have gone wrong for you. Um, and a lot of times we were able to find pretty overt vulnerabilities and problems in the system to get them fixed before they became, um, you know, the actual problem. So that was a really, a really good engagement because we, I mean, in my opinion, DHS is, is on the front lines of, you know, where the threat comes into the United States. Um, mm, cause I mean, yeah. if you've ever, if you ever worked in like real Intel space, especially like I was at FBI and Langley and whatever, you, like, you know, about all the title authorities and all this other stuff. And you've got all your other requirements where uh, DHS and the folks that are taking people in across uh, borders. I mean, that's really where you have the first operational capability of and, and title and a law enforcement operation that where you can enforce it. And for me, it was it was rewarding because I knew that we were making some sort of difference in keeping those systems more secure. So uh, I have I, I got a, a major question I want to talk about, but before I get in there, I was kind of curious. Did you find yourself? You probably can't answer this question, but did you find yourself, you know, um, you know, downrange SSEs and black bagging stuff? Did you find yourself a lot? And is that as well? You probably can't answer that question. Anyway, uh, so let's yeah, move I, on. I would say uh, I would say I did <laughs> some mind. I did some forward deployed operations. Is there all you I go. Say. Yeah, yeah, I figured as much. I figured as much. And the reason why I ask is so for my audience, just so you understand, is that um, there's a lot of people out there that are doing some really amazing things, and there's a huge swath of amazing people you don't hear about at all, and they're they're out there putting themselves in extraordinarily risk huge risks and in dangerous situations um and uh and, and these people come from all walks of life men and women uh whether it be in cyber <clears throat> whether they be you know whatever whatever forces but when you get into when you get into combat and when you get into that having to deal with you know war fighting scenarios um there's a lot of people out there risking their lives to do pretty much amazing things and i, I think it's important to recognize that you know um, on a certain level. So one of the things that I, uh, not getting too much into detail, but with folks that were, you know, in the military that have transitioned to the, the, the pursuit of the private sector in many ways. And I see this firsthand regularly, you know, with guys that are transitioning from certain groups into, you know, doing things, maybe ladies training or whatever the case may be, but I haven't had the chance to really kind of dig into, someone that went from the cyberspace and, you know, deployment scenarios um, and then going into the private sector because it, it's a, it's an, it's a completely different world. It's a different mindset. You know, I had a couple of really close friends. I was just talking to frankly yesterday that I think it's like, wow, you know, what's the mission? What's the, you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of loosey goosiness there to go from something where we're, we're saving lives. Right. Uh, to a little bit of a different sort of perspective in politics, let's say. How has that been for you? How, how has that been that transition for you? Not not easy. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I was probably one of the worst because when I came out of the out of the Navy, I mean, I came from a, a incredibly high op tempo, a very focused, mm -hmm. forward operating sort of op, you know requirement, and. And then the rug gets ripped out from under you and you wind up in the civilian world and everybody's response is like, okay, we'll get to it. You know, it's coming, it's a thing. Well, and you have the clown car meetings and the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the constant uh, movement of management or whatever. And it was, um, it was really hard for me for a few years. I mean, I was, uh, I was a very angry table flipping individual um, trying to get things done at, at military speed. And that just doesn't do it, you know? So I, it was, um, it was uncomfortable and painful for me. I was again lucky that I did work with some organizations where there were ex-military folks that were there that could help me and um, you know educate me on the way to do things better. But uh, I mean, the transition for anybody is not easy. I I don't think. No, and and I and I you use the word better. I think I, you know you're you're being very very kind when I think you say that because. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people think of, you know, government agencies, maybe slow or maybe think of the military, but it's a whole different animal when you're working 
with a group that is, you know, we, I keep using the term tip of the spear because everybody gets that. When you're out in front of it like that, you have to move at an enormously fast pace, make quick decisions, interpret things, and then move forward. And um, as much as you like doing that, as much as you want to do that, and you recognize the importance of doing that, companies don't get that. You know, it's just not in that mindset. And it's good that you were able to work with organizations, especially with folks in the military that kind of could help you kind of go through that. But that, you know, that table flipping <laughs> mentality, I totally get it, man. I think, uh, I think a lot of people struggle in that way, but I think for, for folks like yourself, it's probably, yeah, you know, I, the worst as it gets. The other thing that stands out to me too, that I've noticed, and I still, I still chew on this all the time is I, I hate to say it, but I think in the military, there's a, a an exceptional level of credibility given to people's integrity in the civilian mm-hmm. space. It's not there. Like in the military, if I talked to someone who was in a leadership position and they said something was going to happen, by God, it was going to happen. And if they didn't get it done fast enough, they would find a way to get it done faster. Whereas in the civilian section, I can't count the number. It, it probably happens eight times a day where I talk to someone that is in a leadership position or is an executive or whatever else. And they'll say things and they'll grin at you, but the, the likelihood of them actually delivering on it is substantially low. Yeah, 100%. I, so I, I, I really can relate to that, not directly, but I understand it. And having a lot of friends like yourself, um, you know, struggle with that piece of it, especially, right? So there's not a great deal of clarity on the mission in some cases, and there's certainly not a great deal of integrity or, or, that sort of, there's just like this implied get it done in certain environments. And I think in the private sector, that's kind of hard to grapple with at times because I think, you know, there might be, I don't know, call it politics, call it conflicting attitudes, whatever the case may be, poisonous environments, whatever. But I think at the same time as folks like yourself who find them, find them in those situations, you're, you're just wired differently you're wired for that environment. And I think there's a lot of people out there. I think that the, the person is created from that environment, that high speed, low drag kind of thing. But I think in reality, it's you're, you're geared that direction. Hence why sometimes it's difficult to transition. But I think it's, it's like driving a hundred miles an hour and then being asked to walk somewhere. You know what <laughs> walk I mean? backwards on your hands. Well, yeah. yeah walk backwards, exactly. Upside down while juggling. Right. And look good doing yeah, that. That's yeah. cause you know what I mean? you know, and you know, when we first talked, uh, one of the things I I mentioned to you is, uh, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's a timing thing, who knows, but you know, it was a time when I was like, like very curmudgeon about security, right. I kind of rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And I'll be honest with you, you, the way that you come across, you're, you're like, let's just call it a duck. You're like, no shit right up, right in your face. And I think the, if I may be so bold, I think the industry kind of needs that right now. You know, I think there's a little bit of candy coating, but sometimes you just need to shake people and say, you know, listen, this is horse hockey. This is what you're really to be focused on. So is that, is that something that you, you find, are you seeing people really resonate? Cause I know you have your blog and you have your, your video series that you do, by the way, I should probably mention that. Um, how, how's been the response to that kind of thing? It seems pretty positive. It's real positive. I mean, every once in a while you run across the folks that have nothing else to do but live in their mom's basement and, you know, spread <laughs> haterade. But um, for the majority of folks, like, they really say, I appreciate that somebody's willing to call people to the carpet and, you know, that isn't a isn't influenced and run by, you know, the, mm-hmm. the big vendors and the analyst firms and that type of stuff. And um, I, I've had a lot of small business people reach out to me and ask me to either – come and speak or talk to their folks, which to me is the most rewarding part. Cause I, I know that they need the help and they need some, somebody that can help um, s- simplify this problem space. And it, uh, you know, we, we like to talk about cyber, like it's some crazy unfounded, unsolvable problem. Nope, it's not. I mean, the, the bad guys tell us what they're going to do and people sit around wondering how to solve the problem. Like it, come on, man. Yeah. 100%. I, I think, uh, one of the things I always tell people is, you know, we want cybersecurity to be super sexy, James Bond kind of, you know, rocket science, blah, 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 insert adverb here. And the reality of it is, it's just really consistently applied hard work and, you know, long streams of boredom, you know, inter- interlaced with like total seconds panic, of right? absolute terror. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but, you know, I, I think, um, uh, 
<laughs> and I and I just I think I, I just wrote something like this recently, but you know the NSA published this guide for teleworkers. I think it was today or yesterday, and it's good. It's good. Yeah. I, I'm I'm not you know, but you know what? I wrote the exact same paper in 1998. Right? I I tell people I saw the diagram that they published, and I was like, I'm <laughs> feeling that because that's what I tell people. And now I have it in a diagram. You know. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just like, oh, cool, man. The NSA just backed me up. It's just 20 years later. Right. <laughs> kind yeah. of thing, right? Yep. All right. So, <clears throat> listen, I think um, I think it goes without saying you and I could have this conversation for a lot longer because I really want to. But I, I can't be remiss is we've got to talk about zero trust. You're you're the zero trust guy, for better or for worse. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's your thing. Right. And um I actually have a lot of questions and I, and like I said at the beginning of the show prior to hitting the record button, I have a lot of personal questions because I've been in this rodeo for a while and there's a part of me that thinks it's just a new name for the same thing we used to do. We've always been pushing for but then also I think there's really more sophistication to it now because we have more sophisticated environments. And then I ask myself, well, is this a product or is it a suite of products? Is it a mindset? Is it a strategy? What the, what the, basically what the hell is it kind of thing? So, Help me, help me with the real basics of it. In the most simplest way, when we hear zero trust, or anybody out there in the ether right now listening to this here's zero trust, what is the, how would you define that fundamentally? Zero trust is about removing trust relationships from within digital systems. That's the simplest way that I can put that. Now, that, that definition has some tangents on it that's worth noting, right? Like when we talk about trust relationships, you have to kind of open your mind up a little bit. When I think about trust in a digital system, computers don't give a crap whether or not they like each other or whether or not one smells nice or whatever. If there's a reason for this thing to talk to that and it's allowed, it will happen or it won't based on that not being allowed to happen. So when we're talking about removing trust, trust is a human emotion. It shouldn't be present in digital systems. We want to remove that so that we can manage it because the only organization's that benefit from inherent trust are adversaries. And just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, if I have a bad username and password that's out there on the internet and somebody goes off and buys it from the underground for $1.50, okay, great. Well, my machine, if it's in a trust environment, a heavy trust environment, is going to have admin credentials on it. It's going to have access privileges. It's going to have connections into networks that are further down the road. And if somebody can use that one username and password with those inherent trusted relationships to move into that system, they violated all the principles of security because of that trust. So what we want to do is remove the inherent trust, the excessive trust from these digital systems. And I I remind people, if you're a relatively functional, relatively useful human being, you operate this way in your physical life, why would you not do it in your digital life? And I can... I can run you through that scenario too. So imagine if you're sitting at your house and a random van just shows up in your driveway. Do you just go, oh, look, there's a van? Or do you go (laughs) out there and go, hey, uh, who are you? And they say, oh, well, I'm the plumber. Okay, well, I didn't have a plumber scheduled, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with my house. Please leave. Or, okay, yes, I did have a plumber scheduled. This is the van. Can I see your your business card or something so I know who you are? Cool. Okay. Okay. You can come into my house. You come into my house. uh, You're going to go past the front door. Then we're going to go to wherever the plumbing problem is, and you can fix the plumbing problem. And then when that's over, I'm going to transact with you and pay my bill, and you're going to leave. You don't let the plumber drive up in some random van, walk up, breeze past the front door, and sit in your kitchen and start drinking your beer. Like That's (laughs) what we're trying to move away from in digital systems. That's an amazing analogy. I I, got to give you huge kudos for that because... For me, that really kind of locks it in. That's it's perfect. It's that simple. I mean, that's what I'm trying to it do. It is. People. It's that's that's it, you live that way in your digital. If I walked up to you right now and said, "Can I have your wallet?" You'd be like, "What? I can't." No, you can't have my wallet. And would it make it any better if I said, "My name is Chase Cunningham"? No, you'd still be like, "Why the hell would I give you my wallet?" You know, I don't have a reason to get it, and you don't know what this transaction is going to be, so you don't trust me, even though we've got a relationship going. You don't just inherently trust me to not run off with your money. It's the same thing in the digital space. We're just trying to remove that because what we've architected means that transaction happens just because that's there. I'm taking your money because I showed up. 
Interesting. And it, do you think it's because people can't infer the concept of trust into a digital system? Because like you said, these are human interactions. We you know we've got, you know, thousands, millions of years of, you know, development in our brains and how we interact with people make that happen. But in technology, there's so many layers, right, of how that happens. I don't even think people are realizing that there's an implied, because they think identification and authentication, okay, well then I'm authenticated. I'm allowed to do everything. I don't think they realize that that's like nothing. That's just this. Well, it's very little in the, in the, so that's not trust. I think it's a really key differentiation, correct? Yeah. I mean, everything within a system, if you've ever jumped on, uh, on a network, right, you've been at the airport and the Wi-Fi is there and it says Dulles airport unprotected. Most people would be like, cool, bloop, bloop. And they jump onto that network. (laughs) Now you don't know. I could have set, I can set a router up right now that says Dulles Wi-Fi and you're jumping on my router. And then I'm sending, you know, you through my stuff to suck off all your information and whatever else. But those systems that are built for operational ease of use, the only way that they function right now is because of inherent trust relationships. So Mm. does that mean that we need to make the user miserable? Absolutely not. But what we need to do is put protocols, gates, and controls in place to manage that uh, because we don't want those inherent things to happen. Um, default default logins, default creds are a really bad problem. We want to remove that type of thing. So one of the things that comes to mind, two things actually, just to get a, not too technical, but I think of things like certificates and root certificates and all the kind of stuff that... And what's interesting is our browsers are just jam-packed full of certificates now, right? So we've kind of lost the meaning of it from the word go a little bit, you know, granted ease of use and openness and all that kind of stuff. So I think in some cases what we're doing is we try to move forward with some degree of trust, you know, certificates and authentication, even though these are just very tiny things. But there's a there are ways to apply these at the transactional level, but we've sort of dumbed it down so much, right? So let me let me kind of follow up with that statement with for folks that are listening, is zero trust a product? And I'm asking it specifically because they're everybody's putting that on their page that they're a zero trust provider. Is it a product or what is it as it relates to the technical world? Can I go buy it? No, it is not a product. It is not something that you can go buy. Zero Trust is a strategic initiative that you can take. Now, there are products and platforms and portfolios that can help you enable Zero Trust, but it is not a product. Just like if someone said, is fitness a product? I'd be like, no, fitness is not a product. Fitness is you eat right, you exercise, you sleep, you take some supplements. Maybe if you're trying to operate at a really high level, you juice up. I don't know, but those types of things like that's the the deal is uh, it's a strategic initiative that requires focus planning and technology helps you do those things. You know, it's interesting because it's really starting to sound a lot like security, but like security Zilla, you know what I mean? Like let's take it to the next level. So when, so on a tactical level, are you, when you think, when you say this trust has to be reaffirmed, right? Kind of verification, all this kind of stuff. Are you envisioning a world where, you're constantly being authenticated. Like if I want to make a transaction, each one, like you said earlier, the plumber comes up, I'm going to confirm, okay, through the front door. And you said something really, really important. That analogy is when they're done, they leave. I think a lot of times people are allowed into networks and then that's it. Once you're in the network, like a VPN, for example, right? Um, You know, Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, exactly. So what is it? Is there a way to explain, like, what does it mean in like the in the day of the life of an average person in a zero trust environment? What does that look like for them? Are they so, getting reauthenticated all the time, kind of thing. No, that's why I say that this, if it's done correctly, security is actually uh, almost unobservable to the user. So, in a perfect mm-hmm. world, right? Like, I'm sitting here at my house. We get lots of telemetry off of systems nowadays. Like my my IP address is known. My public facing IP address is known. My phone has got all kinds of cool telemetry on it, including literally if I do this, like they know yeah, yeah. Moving back and forth. Um, you can take my biometrics, all that stuff. So in a perfect world, in a ZT sort of side of it, you're taking in all this telemetry. It's going into a policy engine. And that engine has an ability to push out controls that are looking along the life cycle of that user experience. So I'm at home. We're going to do this call on Squadcast, Okay. Squadcast is an unknown application for me because I've never been to Squadcast. So 
I use my information, my network that pumps me out through Comcast to go off and talk to the internet. The internet talks to the application and all that cool stuff happens. Along that line, my machine should be taking, or this policy engine, sorry, should be taking in that information and going, okay, is Chase where he normally is? Does this look like it's supposed to be? Did he just go from Kuala Lumpur to Kansas in six seconds? Um, is he uh, in front of his phone? Can we do a biometric auth to make sure that that's actually you physically sitting there? There's so many different ways that you can put little bits of telemetry into that to keep that process where you're bounding the controls about it. And then like you're talking about, at the end of it, when this work-related session is over, you punt me out. I don't get unfettered access to that thing. I don't get to sit in your kitchen and drink your beer. Um, and that that's that's part of how this whole thing can work. And it, I, I think, too, that it's also worth pointing out, especially nowadays with like the modern automobiles and electrics. If I had a room full of 100 people and I said, what's the compression ratio on the third cylinder for your engine? They'd be like, what? They just know they get in their car and it drives and they know that the GPS is built in and will tell them where to go. That's the type of technology we're talking about in security of you don't have to know how all this cool stuff works, but the experience will take you from point A to point B in a safer, more secure fashion. Is it, do you think it's truly achievable? Because in that example you just gave, your computer, Comcast, Squadcast, you know, SaaS solution kind of thing. It all has to sort of, do you sense that it has to be all interconnected in some way? Is, is Zero Trust ultimately a centralization and a processing of this telemetry to make these policy-driven decisions? So, for example, is one minute you're in Kansas, next minute you're in KL. Um, who is going to pick that up? Who makes the decision to shut it down? Where's that policy policy apply? Because... I'm with you 110%. I work with an organization back in the late 90s, a financial firm, and I work with them on how to basically cascade shut down essentially banking systems. So if one gets whacked, it didn't kind of get spread across their entire system globally. <clears throat> and we were struggling with who makes the decision, right? Who, where is that decision made? How do we synchronize, if you will, lack of a better term, the information that we understand? This is kind of pre-SIM stuff, by the way. And so every time I think of zero trust, as I think of, it makes total sense to me. I think people get it, uh, certainly cyber dorks, but I'm, I always, I still sort of struggle is where is that decision made? How do I apply that policy in a, is it implied that it needs to be somewhat of a closed system? Like this is my environment and I'm going to have zero trust within my environment. I'm going to control that telemetry in my world. So in a, in a, in a real operational scenario, you typically everybody works for somebody. Those organizations would be the ones that have the policy controls put in place to push out to the users, especially in this remote sort of world that we live in now. So like if I'm working for Ericom, Ericom's got their ZT policy in place and it's able to manage, maintain and control all the stuff that Chase does for the purposes of work. However, when I'm not working for Ericom and I'm off just doing Chase stuff on the Internet, because of my own tinfoil hat stuff, I'm able to use Google's G Suite as my personal zero trust um, brokerage policy engine to get to the internet. And you can do this yourself. Um, there are really good solutions that are out there that are made to do this. I'm a fan of G Suite, not that they're paying me anything or nothing. I just think it's really well architected and it, it does line up on the ZT principles. But an individual can be ZT. An enterprise can be ZT, a government can. And that's the thing, back to your question about why it's not a product, is because a real strategy, a real strategic initiative is something that you do for yourself with your particular problems, and then you make it work. That's why I like to compare it to fitness. Because fitness for me is not the same as fitness for a, an Olympic boxer, but we can both still be fit. Hmm. Yeah, this is this is amazing. I, I now I know why people flock in to see you speak and stuff like that. To be honest with you, because I look like I said at the very beginning of the show is I, I reserved judgment, right? Because I had my own sort of views, and I and I feel like I I'm getting a better better picture of it because but I have a lot of baggage, right? You know, I've been doing security for a long time, so I've got all this sort of you know all these bruises and scars kind of thing, 
And um, so I, I want to go back to something. I mentioned VPN. And of course, you know, people can't see you right now. Is <laughs> You kind of shook your head and kind of laughed a little bit, right? So what what was it about the word V? What is about VPN technology? Is it anti-ZT? Uh, what, what, yeah, it there? is. It is anti-ZT because basically <laughs> it's taking something and poking a hole in a firewall to get you some resource <laughs> that usually has excessive privileges. Now, the other question that I ask people when they talk about the VPN as a security control is, I say, would you run your business on 1996 accounting software? And they're like, no. <laughs> they're like, that's the stupidest thing anybody would do. And I was like, well, 1996 was when VPNs were first offered to the to the network. So, one hundred percent. Time to change, folks. So I'm gonna I, I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a tangent here because um, you you may or may not know this, but I, I wrote a book on IPsec and it was published back in 2000, and I'd worked with the team on the RFCs for the IETF and all that kind of stuff, and. Work, actually worked with Cisco very early days uh, in the implementation of IPsec on their routers. And I'll never forget working with all these vendors in the early days. And if you really understand the the, the RFCs as they were originally put together, because they've changed and all that kind of stuff or have been added to, is the whole concept of AH and ESP and the way that these security associations, these SAs were created, they were intended to be layered. Right. It was you go to the, the router point and then you go to the system and then every system you came in contact with, you had another verification, not just not just straight through. It was always intended to be that piece of it. And that's why IPv6, which IPv4, IPsec is based on IPv6's original age ESP kind of concepts. Anyway, I'm really going off on a technical tangent. The point being is that's why I asked the question earlier is. Sometimes we take really good technology, really good concept, and you go, you know what? I really just want this sliver. I want a tunnel into my network, call it encrypted. I can make everybody happy and sell a gazillion dollars worth of product. But in reality, to your point, it is ancient. It's not only is it ancient technology, let's be honest, but it's a very ancient way of thinking about things. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And don't even get me started on split tunneling, right? So. You just created a thousand routers with your, with your remote. You know what I'm saying, right? You know your internet, your internet footprint just went up by a ten billion percent kind of thing. Um, anyway, I just had to ask that question because I knew that I had a feeling that's where you're going to go. Not to mention everything's kind of uh, hidden. But I think it's important for the listener really to understand is if we're looking at the trust, if is and the whole analogy of the plumber, which by the way is phenomenal. I absolutely love that. I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I might steal that a couple times, but. The, now, the thing is, though, is now imagine that plumber shows up in a in a in a camouflaged van. You can't see it. You can't. All you see is your door open and close. And, and next thing, beer is being drunk out of your refrigerator. That's essentially what you've done with a VPN. Is you just sort of literally open the door and uh, and obfuscated everything that you're dealing with. But uh, so when uh, by the way, also mentioning about that individual zero trust is totally brilliant. I think that's it. My thing is the really ultimate question for you here is where, where, I guess almost I'm thinking of where's this next for you? I mean, I know that you're really doing an amazing job of creating more and more awareness around zero trust. You've taken this concept and you're really opening it up to the world, to be honest with you. And I think people are having real conversations about it. And we're, I think I'm optimistic we're going to get there. You know, but when do you, do you have success stories already under your belt? I mean, are you working with organizations and mobilizing zero trust and seeing that low hanging fruit, those initial successes so far? Yeah. I mean, I've done workshops with a bunch of organizations that have moved towards a zero trust implementation. Um, I, you know, I also am pretty, pretty stoked that the DOD has published uh, Mm -hmm. their strategy on ZT and they've allocated money to an an actual program office. So that's a really nice uh, thing that's happened. And, The fact that companies like IBM and Palo and all these others are publishing studies around the value proposition for ZT, um, I think is, is a win. So it's, um, it's good that there's so much of the market that's picking this stuff up. Um, but it's also one of these things where I don't think the mission ever ends because security continues to evolve, uh, and the need for security continues to evolve. So, um, where we go with it is that this becomes, uh, you're, in the very near future, you're going to sort of notice who the slow gazelles are, right? The mm-hmm. naysayers and the people that said that this is whatever. They're going to be the ones that are the carcasses left on the Serengeti, whereas the other folks, and you're already seeing this, the other folks that have moved towards a ZT approach, they're not showing up in the news. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And it's it's pretty clear to kind of follow along the lines of like, well, you can subscribe to the old model, but you're taking the risk. I mean, it, that's the beauty of life, right? You can choose to be stupid. <laughs> Absolutely. So last, I guess, big question for you is, is it, do you believe, and I think I know the answer to this, but is it realistically to say that if you implement a strategy of zero trust, that could be your security strategy? In other words, all the other things that we do in security, are those dramatically diminished of a requirement when you have a zero trust environment? Like I, I kind of lean in that direction if I'm if I'm honest with you, right? I mean, I think ZT should be your broad strategic initiative for a variety of reasons, including it helps you talk strategically to the board and to the execs and to the people who aren't cybersecurity. I can have a I can have a very real, honest conversation, just like I talked about with the plumber, with people that have nothing to do with security, and people can understand what I'm actually getting at. So, I think. CT, if done correctly, is your overarching strategic initiative that drives and is that conversation uh, enabler um, for stakeholders. But at the end of the day, like you're saying, it's really about how you align the pro- the solutions you need to solve that problem um, and move along those. And the, the, if you focus on the reality of uh, this is a twist in the thing, too, where I think about it. Stop thinking about perfect defense. Stop thinking about that you'll never get breached. You will. What ZT actually talks about is from the bad guy's perspective, if you put those things in place, you would make them miserable. And if I can make the bad guy miserable, they go away. They'll find an easier target. So, you know, it's survivability. I can, like you said, I can live with a tree in the fo- in the forest on fire. I can't live with the entire state of California on fire. Interesting. Because I... I, I... That's you're going exactly where I was thinking is one is just make it painful, make them go away Two, it really does kind of change the calculus. You know, it just changes the calculus. I mean, that that was for me was the watershed moment when I was at Forrester because I came from a red team and background and they I was actually pissed when they were like, look, you're going to take John's dirty laundry and figure out the CT thing. Um, I was like, oh, I wanted to, you know, create my own market initiative and whatever else. But when I started really looking, I was like, well, if these things were in place with this approach as a red teamer, I would quit. Like I'd stop. I'd be like, this ain't worth my time. Mm -hmm. And that was when it was like, okay, now I see where this goes. Yeah. That's very interesting. I I think, uh, I'm a believer. I really am. I do think, uh, you know, we, as cybersecurity, we've always thought about how to kind of add sort of layers, but to be completely honest, we didn't have the technology, you know, I mean, we didn't have really have the initiative. I mean, we were just trying to sell, just the concept of security back in the old days. And I think that, you know, it just, it's taken time to kind of, you know, well, the, I mean, full circle. Rick, Rick Collins said it first, right. Defense in depth is expense in depth. Mm-hmm. And I mean, in the military, our, one of our favorite sayings was if everything is a priority, nothing is. This is true. This is true, man. I got to tell you, this has been awesome. I really <laughs> appreciate you jumping on this. Well, we got into router right? configs and VPN stuff. Like this is, this well, is a geek, geek fest here. <laughs> We, we, we went a little, I, that's my fault. I took us <laughs> off the edge. I apologize. <laughs> well, listen, man, I, uh, uh, I really appreciate it. Really. I appreciate everything. I appreciate the work that you've done. I think, uh, I think zero trust couldn't be in better hands, man. I think you're telling a great story. I, I really, I really, it. yeah, I'm a believer converted. You got me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Another I'm in. Kool-Aid drinker. All right. That's it. I jumped right in. All right, man. Well, listen, I appreciate the time. It's been wonderful. And for everybody listening, thank you so much for joining. And uh, we'll see you next time on Security Bites.